5, 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> okay. Bully, bully. <laughs> what did you say? Bully, bully. You know, it's 1, 2, 3, 4. Bully, bully. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Blue Star Rising, and welcome to. Uh, I hope you're having a beautiful Earth Day. And as you can see, for the occasion, Maya has placed herself in orbit um, around the planet. So, uh, bringing. I'm trying, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying not to disappear. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. It's great. It's like you're phasing in and out of this dimension, you know, bringing us trans dimensional truth. So, it works for me. <laughs> All right. So um, it's particularly appropriate, I think, that it's Earth Day today, um, April, oh. because the a video that, that Maya is sharing with us is the heart of Gaia. It's the sacred science behind the transdimensional existence of that inner realm and its positive and negative poles, and what is at the heart of that reality, uh, which is the um, central sun atoma of uh, Gaia herself, which has this link not only to um, the heart of our sun, but to your heart, my heart, each one of our living human hearts, and the activation of our hearts in alignment with the heart of Gaia is well, not only what this video is about, it is the key to so much of what has, has come through you, Maya, and so much of what I see as well going on in the world in terms of you know what where the transformational arc is, the lever to be seized, the focus for each one of us. And I particularly appreciate the way in which you get specific about it and say, this isn't just, you know, a lovey-dovey hearts and flowers. Isn't it nice to activate our hearts with, you know, sweet emojis we send to each other, which is lovely and fine, but that it is a, um, a profound matter available to every one of us of how to tune in and awaken our hearts and those we meet one by one. So with, without any further ado, because I think this is, um, this video is so rich and, um, and self-explanatory. Uh, and it seems like every sentence could be the subject heading for an entire volume of profound truth. This is my impression of this. So unless you have anything further to say, do you want to say a little bit about well, I think it, you know, just realize how long ago I, I received this. Uh, if I had the time and the energy, I could probably update it considerably at this point in time. But this is what it was then. And of course, I kind of updated it at the end. You know, I talk about it from 2021. But I mean, it's a vast subject. OK, so I could probably, you know, write a whole bunch more on it <laughs> if I had the inclination. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um you do bring it home to today. You do bring it home to 2021 at the end of the video. And we can jump off from there into exploring it. So, yes, this, this comes from material you received 40 years ago, which, you know, by the way, folks, good to remember that a lot of the parlance you see out there on the web when it comes to things like ascension, phrases like, you know, new earth star, um, you know, Ascension Timeline, um, Inner Earth Realm. 40 years ago, more than anybody talking about this, but, you know, Maya, it seems to me, and I think you've found specific instances of this, that um, some of what you brought forward long ago, you know, found its way out into the wider world in the intervening years. It's not like credit matters, but I just like to point it out because part of the great uh, credibility you bring to all this is because, of course, you have been doing this work for decades. Um, and so, 
without further ado, let's yeah. share with everyone um, the heart of Gaia. And we'll be back with you. It's about 17 minutes, well worth your time. And we'll be back immediately afterwards to share and explore. I'd like to begin by reading to you some Fofic material from my previous publication of 1980, Issue 4 of The Source. The natural polar openings of Earth are not obvious to surface-dwelling consciousness or optical spectrum unless an individual were to enter a window or more closely defined, an angle synchronous to the spectral polar magnetic lens capping the windows of the southern and northern doors, that's the polar openings. Once something enters through these windows, it must suddenly adjust to a different etheric field, one of much higher frequency than the surface echosphere's etheric matrix engenders. Some human beings would be capable of surviving this, as well as the change in atmospheric density, higher level of oxygen purity, etc., although it would register as a shock to his or her sensory and nervous system. A beam of light from the sun, however, would go through quite a different experience than a living entity. As light travels from our sun toward the earth, it locates the polar field's intensity of an etheric current through a collective mind or spontaneous quanta directive. That's a quantum directive. The light waves become excited by intense streams of etheric motion and flare into novas or sudden bursts of intelligent harmony. This is evidenced to scientists in the puzzling particle versus wave effect of light. The particle effect as a result of discrete units of thinking waves, not on the level we reason, but nevertheless a cognate response to the ether stream. Ether streams are created by intense concentrations of dimensional pull, opposite attraction, or several other functioning modes of existence through which ether accepts energy and advances that energy. Ether, very simply defined, is a module for dimensional receptivity of space and time. Ether states give the command to form, to expand, to reduce. The ether is commanded by the universal laws of the harmonies. The various programs of the ether computer or command pulse are defined as X-grams. Each X-gram supplies a line or continuity band for a specific entity of function. These lock together to produce the whole working body of image, form, function, replication, assimilation, absorption, back into the etheric computer to be reprocessed. Thus, as the light beam traveling from the solar sun toward the Earth attaches its directive code to the Earth stream of the Earth's solar vortex, the incoming light beams migrate their etheric quality toward the polar doors of the planet. As the light beam approaches the polar door, say the northern apex, it has become special in that its etheric exgrams are active at the amplitude of the energy package's quality. This energy package is the light waves, as well as the magnetic properties and other refined energy types of the whole energy beam. When the energy beam enters through the northern apex, and this it can do easily, as its exgrams have adapted its function for harmonious reception by the spectral polar lenses, it enters the Rega passage, a funnel of sensitive particles so high in etheric bonding as to be almost interdimensional. I would pause to qualify that text almost interdimensional as being actually that in between of dimensions, which is sort of sub interdimensional because that's the realm of the uh, hollow of the planet. To continue, this passage leads straight to the Atoma and into the Regula Opsa. 
the passage from the northern door into the atoma enters the positively polarized chambers of the atoma heart. That's the regular opsa. The southern door passage leads into the negatively polarized chambers. Within the regular opsa, there is an intricate exchange of current or purifying of blood, which causes a transformation of their excrams within this seed flame, the ani. The innermost holy of holies within the automa is the ani, which is a bursting of transformation, a nova of completeness. Here, where the light beams of both northern and southern passages of the rega meet, the energy inherent to the carriage which brought it to the center of our planet, the solar light beams, inclusive of other light sources such as distant stars, is transmuted from gross to subtle in a wave of the alchemical wand. Most of this refined gold is received interdimensionally, but some is taken through the pulsing of the earth heart and speeds throughout the arteries and veins of the planet. How much is retained for earth's etheric refinement? and how much is transfigured to the state of ascension into the higher realms is determined by the etheric excrams bonding our world planet at the time of this internal heart nova the excrams of earth change in accordance with the determination of the spiritual evolution of the planet as a whole solar light beams do not enter into earth's core in a constant procession while some refracted light is filtered through the polar lens, the procession of the reg passage occurs only at the equinoxes and solstices of the year. As the purified and upgraded energies which are captured by the ethers of the earth are circulated throughout the planet via the resonant cavity effect of the central hollow, all nature receives its portion of this elixir of regeneration. Certain topographical conditions create special conduits for the recharging of these refined energies as they are distributed upon the surface of the planet. The Mesa Verde Plateau in Colorado is one of the major receiving stations on Earth, the major station for the North American continent. As explained in both issues of 180 and 380 of, of the source, the Mesa and Table Mountain is like a resonating disk where the geocosmic energies of the ascending Himalayan and descending Titicaca plateaus converge to exchange current within the sacred knot of the Emerald Table. That's atop Mesa Verde. The Mesa Verde then acts as a giant dolomon in its function within the esoteric temple of Earth. In Louis Charpentier's The Mysteries of Chet Cathedral, he writes of the large, table-like dolomans of the sacred temples. And I quote, The remarkable instrument, which is a dolomen, a stone table resting on two, three, or four supports, rather resembles the metal strip of a xylophone. The table submitted to two contrary forces, its cohesiveness and its weight, is thus in a state of tension and is susceptible to vibration like the stretched piano string. It is at the same time an accumulator and an amplifier. Thus the potency of the telluric wave attains its maximum force in the dolominic chamber, which acts as a resonant drum. End of quotes. And now I say, as the refined energies released from the nova within the earth heart pass through such dolominic stones as the Mesa Verde Plateau, they are fortified with original intensity and sent forth again to reverberate throughout the earth's temple. Mountains perform a similar function to the flat-topped plateaus, but different in that they retain more than they re-emit in an immediate sense. This serves an equally important purpose in that mountains release the energies received through internal seepage or radiation rather than direct power waves. They also draw directly from the interior and emit like a pyramid from the zenith of their summits. These summit emissions are thin streams which are taken into the atmosphere to charge clouds. 
the planet in its entire structure and function can be viewed as a beautiful and complex temple, simple in its divine cosmetrics, the order of measure, function and symbolic relationships through which the universe enacts its harmonic principle. The cosmetric order is a dance, a symphony, in concert with its internal memory of divine birth. It is both the creative essence and the created form. It is the motion of function, and it is, conversely, the stillness of a sacred knowledge too infinite to submit to the moving rush of its founding intelligence. We can see the mirror of this logic in the brilliance of light. To the human eye, light is a revealer of obstacles, an enhancer of space and dimension, a regulator of contrasts and colors. To the soul of the human complex, light is the beauty of hidden sound, the dissolver of distance between the divine and the seeker. It is a communicator of indwelling mind, superseding space and time. Light is our refuge from darkness and our sanctuary of hope. It is our brilliant oracle interceding for us in the offices of the Most High. We unconsciously seek luminosity as we do the heights of mountains. Whether or not our reason is illuminated with the quest, our hearts are surely lifted to the voice of light. Be there no soul so entrenched in the mire of retribution that it does not respond lovingly to light? The pupils of the eyes contract, the senses stir. Our mind is lifted in its resolute consequence to the bridal rays of our star sun as it imbues this orbiting sphere with the kiss of light. The human heart houses the heart chakra, which is intimately linked from conception to the regular opsa of the earth atoma. We and the earth are literally one, the light that travels in grand procession upon the regga passage entering the earth heart reaches our pulsing organ as well. Through etheric bonding, time and space are eliminated, and the light serves as a vessel of communion between man and his earth. The sacred temples of Subterranea, like the ancient temples and great Gothic cathedrals, recreate the regga passage in earth and in man in the placement of their windows, hall, shades of stained glass, so that the passage of light into the temple is symbolically equivalent to the journey of light upon the grand procession of the Rega. A single beam of light, a translucent essence, symbolizing the soul, housing therein the spirit of fire, is diffused through the intricacies of mind. Harbored in the most regent channels of space, it approaches steadfastly the point of mergence with matter. In the temple, this act of consignment is registered in the harmony and beauty of a perfect coupling, the light and the stone, the space and the time. The very hollows of the temple respond to the sacrament of twining, the rose of light with the thorn of matter which pricks our consciousness and spurs us through our material existences. Among the holiest of central earth temples is the Temple of the Twining, wherein the splendor and sacred geometry of the Rega Passage, the physical spiritual functioning of the earth heart and its mergence in twin flame with the heart chakra of man is displayed and enacted through ceremony. This concludes the reading of my 1980 article. And so now, in 2021, as I'm speaking to you here, what is the significance for us at this time and in this space? We are being called upon in a very intrinsic and essential way to connect to our hearts. And it's not just a matter of little heart icons and smiley faces, which I like and use. It's much more than that. It goes much deeper. And you all know that, of course. But when I say deeper, I'm talking about the regular opsa, the regular passage. 
our connection to the central sun at Toma of the earth, of the seed flame, the Ani, in the very center, the very heart of the sun, which Thoth often refers to the whole, uh, the whole um, Atoma as the golden rose. This is not something that is as separate from us as we may think. When I speak of it all being in a slightly removed dimension, you think, oh, well, that's, you know, way off there. But it's not. We're in a slightly removed dimension on many levels of our being. And some human beings on this planet, like I feel I am, are actually concurrently living lives in the inner earth. Or if not there, in other parts of the, of the planetary consciousness, whether it's uh, aiding the planet on a starship from another a kindred world, and yet in this envelope of consciousness, whether it's a an alternate lifetime in another magnetic electromagnetic zone, these can all be qualified in different ways. And I'm not. This is not what this uh, video is about, so I'm not going to go into that. But the point is that the heart. When we speak of connecting to the heart, when the ultras, the inners, the angels speak of connecting to the heart. They are talking about a much wider spectrum than we can even imagine. And yet it is not too steep a mountain to climb because we are naturally inclined to express that deep heart resonance. We've gotten off center with it. For the most part, you know, we are here on this earth to serve our spirit. The soul is a servant of the spirit. And certainly the body is a servant of the soul. It's a marvelous, magical daisy chain that all connects and finds a solid root within the heart of earth. All right, welcome back. And Maya, before we shared the video, you were saying that, yes, this comes from material you received 40 years ago, but then at the end, you know, you, you beautifully brought it forward into the great relevance today in terms of that, you know, the relationship of the heart of Gaia actually has a direct connection to our own hearts has a direct connection to the heart of our son and that there is this as you describe it well it's on one level it's wonderfully complex dynamic going on of the activation between those three centers but it is both powerful and simple in terms of our own hearts do you want to expand on that a little bit just in terms of what you feel like the the essence of the message contained in in this transmission is yes well we we are just beginning and when i say just beginning you know i think it started i can't actually give a total demarcation point but it seemed to me that we became a lot more holistic as we neared 2012 you know we had this thing about the the Mayan calendar and all of this, and everyone got excited about that one way or the other. Some thought, well, it's the end of the world, and some thought, you know, it's the beginning of a new world, and all of this. And so, you know, but, you know, from a Thothic perspective, the um, 2012 was a breaking point, a breaking open point, not because of Mayan calendar, and I'm going to go a little further with that in a moment, but because humanity decided it was going to be a new era. And when they had a consensual decision, and I don't mean every human being on the planet, of course not, but you know, the hundredth monkey effect, you had enough people that were going 2012, 2012, you know? And so it happened. And there was definitely a shift there. And yes, a lot of negative stuff started happening too, but you know, that's because we're opening, we're cracking the shell open. We're opening up this whole, this whole, experience that we have here and we have to clear out a lot of things i i heard on um, uh some show the other day and it made perfect sense to me and i got a, a yes from thoth on it that <clears throat> the mayan calendar is um 
there we've decided that we know what year it is according to the mind calendar because we're using the christian the christian calendar and and this thing said hey you can't do that you have no idea <laughs> what what really you know 2012 it, it could be 20 25 it could be 2030 you don't really know what the mayans were were connecting to and and and, and thoth really agrees with that but he also says you see for, from his standpoint Everything has to do with consensual reality and with what we believe and how we present it to the universal timelines and, and all of this. This is our universe. It's a holographic universe and we are at the center of it. Yes, there are other beings coming and going and they share certain holographic touch points with us. But if we're dealing with quantum reality, which we are, we cannot say that we live in a linear um, universe that has certain laws that you that are absolute and you cannot you know go past them we already know that you can go past the speed of light if you get outside that linear experience and you know I said this before but when Edgar Mitchell was working with me and I said you know I gave him something he said but that's beyond the speed of light and I I said yeah you know, and he is when he said, well, it's that's no small potatoes. Well, you know, now he wouldn't flinch because I'm just not seeing Harriman and all these other people that are talking about this. But in those days, it was still, even with someone as broad minded as, as, as Dr. Mitchell, because I mean, look what he was doing. He was researching me. So he was very broad minded. But, you know, even for him, that was a leap. Now, why I'm getting all of, off on all of this is because we're reaching a moment in time now where we're being asked to go beyond looking at, at even at our earth. Oh, let's, we're reaching for the stars. Okay. So yeah, now we're beginning to think about, well, maybe we're have different timelines. Maybe they're even the, even the scientists are saying different dimensions, you know, even they're beginning to go there and all of this, this is great. But we're being asked to go further and say, our planet, just as it is, without going to other stars, without thinking about the holographic universe, without thinking about any of that, just our planet is, is so deep and rich, inner Earth, outer Earth, um, all these other shells of electromagnetic zones. Um, Thoth gave me something on crystals the other, no, no, he didn't give it to me. He gave it to me maybe 50, 30 years ago. Okay, but I found it in my in my files. I wish I had to pull it up right now to read it. But this one little thing about how crystals operate. And I was just like, it was just a paragraph. And I was like, oh my God, because I couldn't remember I wrote that, you know, that long ago. So it's, it's not that we're going to be swamped with complexity. It's that we're going to be rising to the occasion of receiving what we used to think was so complex and or we wouldn't have been able to understand it at all and now it's going past the zone of of memory or mind and it's going into the heart and you're feeling it and when you feel it then you start knowing it and you start understanding it and that's where we are right now with all of this so back to the heart of the planet in its process, the regular opsa and out and the regular passage and all that. This is this is the stuff that our ancestors' rituals were based on. They were carried out through the eons because they could not grasp it scientifically. Well, some could, but I'm talking about looking at the ritual format that came through, out through history and time, even the worshiping of the sun and all of this. They had to put it in another context. In a way, we as human beings now on this planet have been spent years ritualizing things, and we don't think we have. But science, into itself, the very linear kind of science that we've been proclaiming as our god for centuries now, you know, that's a ritual. That that is, it's time to understand what the ritual really means. And to expand into the true science. Everybody's saying now, oh, we gotta listen to the science. You gotta, you gotta, you know, with the you know what, you gotta listen to the science, listen to the science. And it's like you're not listening to the science, you're listening to a ritualized version that certain scientists have proclaimed as the religion of the day. 
Now, I'm not saying that some of what they're saying isn't true. I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm just saying that not all of it is. And it's not about worshiping the idol of science. Because if you do that, you miss the true sacred science of the universe, which is so unfolding and continuing and continuing. And it's not blocked in by linear thinking. So back to the back to the um, the regular opsa. I mean, this is the the heart of the planet is speaking to us. It's been speaking to us forever, and our ancient people knew that, but we don't. And now we're beginning to wake up to that in various ways. So I think that that's what this this treatise that Thoth gave me that I just recently put into this video expresses. It expresses that, you know, he's talking about the in, inner earth, the stained glass windows and the things that bring in the light, you know, and even the surface cathedrals, while they didn't understand the regular ops and all of that, they had some kind of a memory somewhere that brought into the sacred sciences the need to let the light in and the solstice and the equal, you know, all of this is connected to the greater picture of what happens at the solstices and the equinoxes in the interior of our planet. And the, and the rituals that are still performed in the inner earth, but with full knowledge of the science behind it. <laughs> well, there are so many things you just said that light up for me. When we're talking about, you know, science as a ritual, um, you know, when you, when you read Emmanuel, you know, Kant and David Hume, when you try to look at the, you know, the progress of the search for certainty in the West and the Enlightenment, you know, the looking at the, the myth of objectivity, you know, the myth of science, scientistic um, is a phrase that, you know, brings out the, the over-dependence, you know, the myopic narrow view. And of course, a lot of what we're seeing is being called, you know, oh, they're denying science. Well, yes, but a lot of that so-called science is bad pseudoscience, corrupt science hired and paid for by certain agenda interests, which want to convince us of one thing or another. But the, the ritualizing of it that you're describing and how we've lost touch with, you know, the meaning that our ancestors intuited about, you know, our relationship to Gaia, our relationship to the sun. There's a wonderful story that Carl Jung tells when he traveled in the American Southwest and visited with Pueblo Indians. And this is sometime like in the 30s or 40s, you know, before so much of that culture was, was lost. And he was speaking to a tribal elder about their morning ritual of greeting of the sun and that the, the the ancient rituals that they performed and their belief was that it was absolutely essential for them to be present in this way to the rising of the sun that without their doing this without their establishing this personal direct contact the sun would cease to rise that it was in fact their relationship to the sun that made this reality of light and warmth carry on and so of course now you know in come the colonizers and and uh and the state and you know and the southwest you know what happens to it and and the tribal elder he was speaking to realized that they were about to lose this profound meaning of their lives that their direct personal relationship to the sun and he said spirit gave unto each people a cup in which to hold their life. Meaning, you know, each of our understandings, our relationship to Gaia, it doesn't gave unto each people a cup to hold the meaning of their lives. And our cup is now broken. And so, you know, heartbreaking, really, when you think about it, because this elder recognized the coming of Western rational civilization and understanding. Mm -hmm. Our cup is now broken, our cup of, of meaning where this ritual was, was so profound. So, yeah. And, and what you said also about um, 
2012, I thought was so powerful, you know, that, um, that there was something about the expectation that we were moving into a new understanding, a new energy, a new realm that helped create it. You, you might've heard me mention this before, but um, in 1987, there was in August of 87, there was the harmonic convergence, right? Which is Jose Arguez and was also based on the Mayan calendar and was this big flood of incoming energy. And if only half a million people, he said, could tune in at that, that brief time period on the 17th of August, of 87, that if half a million people around the planet, and this was pre-internet, it's like radio shows, yeah. and underground, and now, yeah, if only a half a million people could tune in and visualize peace in the world at that time, you know, that, that amazing things could unfold. And I've often said that, you know, if Jose Agreas had gotten up on some big radio or TV show and said, if we get half a million people, I now prophesy, I will prophesy unto you all that within four years from today, the Iron Curtain will fall. Germany will be peacefully reunited. The Soviet Union will peacefully dissolve. Nelson Mandela will be released from prison and become president of a free South Africa. Um, Václav Havel will be released from prison, the great playwright and writer, and become president of a free Czechoslovakia. There will be, the, you know, Germany will be reunited. The Berlin Wall will fall. The Cold War will peacefully end. All of this will happen within four years if only all of us would just pray for peace together. Well, he could have said it. It would have been dismissed as complete insanity. Every single one of those things was completely unthinkable at that time. And every single one of those things happened within four years. Yeah. It was one of the most radically transformational times in human history. We've forgotten, it seems, you know, almost what went on. And I feel like part of what we're sharing here is that we're at a similar moment. You know, here we are, Blue Star Rising. Yeah. You're bringing this in. But it feels that powerful to me. It, it feels that, you know, we're, we're just, there are many other people in, and groups and brother sisterhoods out there doing this similar work. And it feels like it's part of as, as potentially powerfully transformational in the moment to me. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, you know, back to our quantum logica inter, inter, interactive, I always stutter over that, quantum logic interactive, the new name for it. Um, I, we're feeling that with our project. It's different. We don't have a thousand people meditating together, but we have a quantum field that's, that is created with these toroidal boxes that are creating incredible quantum fields just unto themselves. And then, then when they're linked to the hierophy cube in the inner earth and the, the being the persons that are operating that there and connecting to our field. And now we're told, both told me, that we're having, going to be experiencing an upgrade of the whole system, a new platform, not a new name, just a new platform. And um, so, you know, there's nothing we can prove at this time because we've just started it. But I can sit here and prophesy if I wanted to stick my little neck out and say, well, all these fabulous things are going to be happening in another uh, four, five, six years that will maybe not entirely be because of what we're doing today, but a large part or a good slice of the pie will be because of what we're doing with this project. And I'm not one to say stuff like that. Believe me, I'm not. Yeah. But I just feel it. And so do, not just me. I mean, everybody in our group is like that. They're just waking up in the morning and going, oh, my God, this is fabulous, you know. And so we're feeling it in our being. And uh, I'm sure there are other groups that are doing the same thing. I mean, not the same thing we're doing, but I mean, it's having the same feeling. Because you see now, there's more teeth in the substance. We, we're breaking down the, um, the archonic, uh, um, what I want to, encrustation that has built up like plaque over our, our sphere. And um, this coming from the archon cloud or the virus, as Thoth calls it, and not, not the virus, but he talked about it as a virus years ago. And um, so as, as this breaks down, 
it, it's not gonna go poof overnight by any means, unfortunately, but as it breaks down, those like my, you know, our quantum logic of group, other group, we'll be able to really have some teeth in our work. We won't be fighting against a huge stream. It seems like we ought to be because there's so much negativity going on right now, but that's just the falling away of the gross. And we have an opportunity now with these groups of people that are sincere in doing the good work in all different ways, whether they're in church praying or they're in quantum fields operating as we are, to make a huge difference that was not possible, not to this extent, just five years ago. That's how fast it's going. And this is what Thoth is telling me. Um, but I can feel it in my bones, <laughs> you know? I can feel it happening. So yeah, it's very encouraging. We just have to keep our, our, our eyes on that star. I know that that star is us. Mm. Yeah, and this is reminding me, you know, for um, our, our friends, family, viewers, newcomers watching today that, you know, that you, Maya, have this work, which you've been doing for so many decades, of bringing in and sharing this, you know, high stream of, of sacred knowledge. And you also have the work that you do on a, on a personal level for, you know, as an Akashic uh, translator and counselor, one-on-one uh, -on -one for people. And, you know, it occurs to me that when I think about the people who are watching this program right now, you know, we've got come close to a thousand subscribers and hopefully a lot more soon, but the numbers don't matter. It's who you are, what souls, you know, are drawn to this particular channel, to, to this work, right? And if it's lighting you up and you're sensing the reality of it and sensing your relationship to it, the question, you know, may naturally arise, as it certainly did for me, it's like, okay, what's my role? How can I help? And what's my story that I may have forgotten? My soul hasn't forgotten it, but gosh, it sure would be nice to be able to, to reconnect with, you know, what part of the play am I in right now? It would help me to know, you know, what acts one and two were about as we're entering the denouement of act three and the climax here. I know it was certainly that way for me, you know, um, when I had my, um, you know, sessions with you about, you know, my own place in the story and that, you know, there are, of course, hundreds of past lives, incarnations to, to choose from, you know, if you want to skip around, but that the ones that, that come in for you when you're sitting down with someone are those three or four that are most relevant to this life, to this mm -hmm. dharma, to this role we're playing. And so I just want to encourage everybody, not only because, you know, it's an important part of, of, of Maya's work, uh, in terms of, you know, the, the support that comes in for, for her work, but just sheer on, you know, on the sheer spiritual value, um, level of it. So, um, I mean, I, I suppose that comes fairly near to being what we'd call a plug. And so I'll say it's unabashedly <laughs> a plug. And at the end of, uh, the program, there's a link and just send an email to Maya at newearthstar.org if you want to inquire about that. Well, no, they don't have to do that now because I have Acuity. So they, they click on the link and it'll take them to my page that does have my email address if they need to ask me questions, but then they can just click and they can automatically schedule. It's beautiful. Ah, just click Acuity. Up I haven't schedule. heard yeah. I, so I, that way I don't miss anything. Like I was missing emails before and stuff. Now I don't have to worry about that. It's all up there. Ah, okay. Okay, cool. Um, all right, well, let's so yes, you're going to say something. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just going to come back to the, the the subject matter here, which is, of course, the heart of Gaia, and how it relates to our heart. Um, and the more we delve into the interdimensional field of our beingness, the greater the connection we will have between the regular apsa in the 
central sun of the earth and our heart because it's always there the connection is always there but being aware of the connection allows you to uh, pull the levers you know and control the situation it's like it's like if you're in this fabulous sports car and you're sitting there in the sports car but you're deaf dumb and blind and you can't and your hands are tied and your feet are tied <laughs> and you're sitting in the car you don't know <laughs> you're sitting in this fabulous yeah. car all you have to do is you know just undo just undo your ties and and turn on the lights and and go oh my god a steering wheel <laughs> you know? i thought i was you in know? a cave i'm in a maserati yeah. oh, my right god. right and you can put your foot on the pedal and away you go oh, you know yeah. and so that's what we're experiencing right now just that beginning to go ah oh, let's see oh wow yeah. oh what's here oh wow you know and and the and the link the strongest link of course is the heart is the connection to the earth as both has said over and over just get your you know it's okay to look at the stars and understand the vastness of the universe all this is beautiful but don't think that you can just take off go up there go to your home star or whatever leave the planet behind oh we don't like this planet anymore no this is your sacred home until you take it in and become everything she is everything gaia is then you can go elsewhere mm -hmm. <laughs> and besides we're in a process of taking her with us you know taking the planetary genius and putting it in another a zone of experience because that's the way it works you don't get to say i don't like this game anymore i'm too advanced to this i'm going to go somewhere else right, <laughs> you I, know? I know people it doesn't work that way you're I, here I myself a few times yeah 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 exactly so um you know so guy is helping us do that and the way she's helping us the most is through her heart consciousness and we have to connect to that you know yeah and you know, it is, it is, it is real. It is personal. It is very easy, I think, in particularly in you know in our Western mindset, to think of oh yes, the Gaia concept. I've heard of that. That the, you know the planet as a biosphere tends to sort of behave almost as if it's a conscious being. What a lovely theory. No, this is a personal reality. Yes, there's you know the uh, the. Um, unmanifest ground of all being the impersonal reality you know beyond the void of manifestation you know okay and there's the divine mother and her manifestation here as gaia and it's not theoretical it's not just a lovely way of framing things she's real she's personal she will talk to you you can hold her hand you can commune directly with her and like anything else, you, you know, you have to practice. You have to start. I mean, there's our wonderful friend, Nancy Hopkins, who um, is my co-host on the other um, online show that I do, Radio 5G. And uh, Nancy is a former U.S. Army energy weapons specialist uh, back in the 70s. And, um, you know, fairly high level counterintelligence information coming in. And since then, you know, a, an authority on, on minerals and one of the world's top authorities on the properties of Shungite and Shungite's link to the quantum field and the way Shungite works with quantum intention. And in the course of this discovery over the last 10 years or so of working with Shungite, Nancy began to tune in to Gaia and feeling the reality of Gaia and you know in her own way most likely powerfully communing with the heart of Gaia in her own way and she told me and I'm, I'm not like spilling personal secrets here she shared this uh, on the air that she was at her computer and, and working with the Shungite field and, and and feeling the reality of Gaia and Gaia's presence and she heard a voice a you know beautiful woman's voice simply say hello and she's just like you know gaia and and you know you have to understand nancy hopkins is one of the most grounded earthy and at the same time you know way out there cosmic i mean 
you know, you feel like you're talking to uh, a, a U.S. Army tank commander, which in fact you are, to quite a famous one, in fact. But, you know, so Gaia, and she, the, the voice says hello, and, and then goes on to say, yes, I have a voice. And there's an incident that happened not too much later, there was a terrible disaster in a mine in Colorado that resulted in huge, I mean, millions of tons of extremely toxic waste being poured into the river system. It's called the King Mine Disaster. And somebody from the Environmental Protection Agency who was doing an inspection hit the wrong button and suddenly millions of tons of these horrible toxins were released at a point in the river system where it was going to poison the water of the entire Southwest River system, including tribal lands you know, where it was their lifeblood, that water. And at that point, she had a Shungite network, and they, were, they knew that Shungite could purify water. They knew that Shungite operated on the level of the quantum field. They actually had devices you could place in water that would purify it. And they go, oh my God, this is an enormous environmental disaster in the making. People call this Nancy. Can we can we get the devices? You know, to the key tributaries. No, there isn't time. But there is simply not time. It's flowing. It's 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 on its way. But she said, but it operates on the quantum. It operates etherically. We can ask the help of the elementals, and the devas and the angelics, and create etheric versions of these cleansing quantum field shungite devices at these key tributaries. And so it, you know, they pulled everybody on board. <laughs> Galactics, elementals, angelic devas, friends here and there, and they're creating this. And Nancy is an extremely talented remote viewer. She, it was part of her value in counterintelligence. And she told us that she pulled back at a certain point, and they're putting all this together as fast as they can. She pulled back into a remote view, looking over the entire American Southwest from like somewhere in Western North Carolina. And seeing what could happen with the river system. And then suddenly seeing all these little lights appearing all over that part of America. Little lights, two, three lights coming together to form a bigger light. Those lights coming together to form still a bigger light, all these lights. And she felt the presence of Gaia. And they were about to say, okay, we need to activate this etheric cleansing. And she heard Gaia's voice say, wait. And the lights began to multiply and collect and grow. And Nancy realized that these lights she was seeing were human souls becoming aware of what was about to happen and at a powerful level of the soul saying, no, this must not be. This is our, this is our mother earth. And at a certain point, it reached a tipping point uh, the light of all these souls with their intention and their consciousness affirming the cleansing. And Nancy heard Guy's voice say, now. <laughs> and uh, it disappeared. The pollution simply disappeared and they had no explanation for it. You know, it was massive uh, toxification of the river system. And, uh, uh, Maybe it'll just like settle to the bottom or something. Well, no, you know, we cooperated with Gaia. We tuned into Gaia, enough of us did. And Nancy and her team doing the work, you know, of of using the Shungai reality in the quantum field. So I just tell that story because it just, it's it's a concrete example of what most would term a miracle. And it simply happened because of our heart to heart cooperation with Gaia. Yes, indeed. And, you know, as you're telling this again, of course, I've heard it before. It's an amazing story. Uh, I'm thinking about our, our new little inner group that's formed inside the Quantum Logic Interactive. And it's not, it's, it's being spearheaded by one of our ladies. I, I you know, and I'm, I'm really glad they're doing it. I, I just don't have the time to, to, to uh, you know, be that involved with it. But it's wonderful that they're doing it uh, because they're using the terminals, you know, the, the cubes. Mm-hmm. And, and everything and it's and so I, I thought I'd just give it a name when I was setting up the chat and I just decided to name it um, uh, quantum weather menders because after the book of one of our our members uh, Deborah Dinkers written a wonderful book called weather menders you should look that up uh, it's a fictional book but not you know I mean it has a lot of 
truth to it. Anyway, so we named the group that, and they're just going to town, you know, working with weather. That's what they're working with. So it reminded me of that, and I was thinking, you know, that what happened to the thing that's going on in, in Florida? Isn't it Florida where the toxic thing is building up and they're, they're afraid the, they were afraid the dam was going to burst and all this toxic water was going to flood into Florida? Uh, I'm thinking that might be something we need, you know, our weather measures need to work with. Yeah. You know? yeah it's about yeah. intention. I don't know what to it. it was on the news and then all of a sudden they didn't hear anything more about it. Yeah. yeah. But that's the kind of thing that, you know, we all, whether, whether we have quantum cubes or not, we can all work with, we can all pray for, and, and you know, we have an ability to, to do that. Now, from the Sothic perspective, this can, yes, we can do that, and we can make a difference in individual things, but we have to still keep our eyes on the, the higher picture, the greater picture, because otherwise, we're just constantly putting the fires out, you know, put this fire out, put that fire out, it's God- Thank God we can put them out, but there's another fire. Okay, we got to put that one out. But the, the greater purpose of the of the uh, quantum logic is to work on the bigger picture, on things that are beyond that level, because then they affect that on a much wider scale. So it's good to have both. It's good to have both going there at the same time. Yeah, I mean, for me, as the son of a holistic pediatrician, you know, why treat symptoms when you can treat the heart of it, you know, and cure the essence at the causative level. And that's, you know, really what we're talking about because it's like putting a band aid on a bullet wound while there's a sniper in the tower, you know, this is the, the game. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, this is, those, those, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Please. Sorry. I was just going to say, really, we need both right now because people are, if people are bleeding, they need help right in the moment. But at yeah. the same time we're doing that, we need to be able to, work on that other level as well. We gotta do, we gotta do both. That's the way, because right. things are so immediate right now, you know, and the, and the greater picture works slower. So get out there and bandage the wounded, but you know, know that you're working on the greater picture that's gonna stop the whole thing, but we'll not stop it. I have to say transform it, because yeah. the, 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 the truth of the matter from the South expect is that we're not going to save this planet as it is now, we can't reverse all the pollution and, 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 and quell all the violence and, you know, make everything peaceful and harmonic and we're making paradise on earth. What we're doing is we're making things as copacetic as we can so that when we reach the point of light principle 40, that's what's terminology for the quantum burst, when we move from one world system one to world system two, the ascension, when we get to that point and we take the planetary genius with us into a new earth, that at that point, we have brought enough things together. We have quelled enough fires. We have, we have brought humanity to a certain state of awareness so that we can gracefully do what we need to do to move into that new reality with, with our, our planetary genius in hand. So, uh, if we look at it from that perspective, we see as sad as it sort of seems to our heart, we're not going to see paradise on the earth that we see or that we have our feet on right now. It's going to fall away. But it's a matter of how that happens and where our awareness is in the process of it. And that's what's so important. And of course, we're going to help each other as much as we can to make it a, a more easeful experience and not such a horrible, you know, deadly thing we're going to make it as easeful as possible and we're going to make it so that there's a transition involved and souls can be ready for that and experience it in a loving light rather than a fearful uh you know uh unawareness yes and could you just briefly touch on the meaning of the planetary genius for those who are you know joining us haven't seen the previous programs in terms of, you know, particularly in talking about the heart of Gaia, that it's such a, a beautiful reality that's described by the planetary genius. Could you just share a little bit on it? Right. I don't have the, the, the uh, part that I say a lot memorized, so I'd have to read that. So I'm not going to do that, but I'll put it in my own words. And, and that is 
the planetary genius is contains the the signature of everything that we have humanity or all living things have produced in consciousness that is of a higher nature not the lower growth stuff just the higher nature and it comes together to form this this genius in other words you can't be smart if you're carrying a lot of stupid baggage so you throw away that stupid baggage and you become a genius <laughs> now that's maya speak okay that's not so speak <laughs> but but basically that's what it is you're you're getting rid of everything not getting rid of but you're simply not choosing to embrace the 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 lower element the lower thoughts and all of this the planetary genius has a filter on it it just goes i'm taking in everything of the higher nature now it can record everything that there is but it doesn't receive it it says i see it but i choose to take only the the shining qualities of that into this this heart of the genius it's not something you can hold in your hand you're not going to see it when you go into the inner earth it's not that kind of a thing you know it's beyond all of that but it's very real and it's in it's, it's in the heart of Gaia, when he talks about the Ani, the sacred seed, it's inside the sacred seed of the Ani, of the heart of Gaia. And, you know, I think of that on, on a personal level and think of all the people who, you know, all of us in our lifetimes and, and struggles, everything, that, everything beautiful and higher that we strove for, that we wanted to to leave behind that we wanted to to give that we wanted to have our life have some impact some meaning all of that as i understand you it's harvested it's preserved it's yes. sold in in the heart of gaia you know um a friend of mine i you know had a conversation with uh, yesterday uh she said what is my legacy of love that I will leave behind. And that's what this is about. You know, it almost seems as if the, the planetary genius is that legacy of love of all of humanity contained within the heart of Gaia that is what will be lifted and cherished and, and preserved in this unimaginable transformation that we're calling ascension. Yes, yes. Yeah. And the beauty of it also is, which both were showing me as you were speaking, Michael, is that uh, all the things that seem to have failed, the good efforts on the planet that failed, people were assassinated before their time. John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, just to name a few. Um, you know, if they had lived, we always think, oh my God, if they had lived, you know, what would happen? what beautiful things could have happened. But no, they were it, tragic, tragic, tragic. And of course it's tragic, but, and, and you can look at it in people's lives that never got famous, but they had something beautiful to give and they worked to give it and they worked and then it didn't happen. It didn't seem to happen. It was a failure, but there are no failures because the goodness that they, that they bring up from the surface of their being, that goodness, remains and it's recorded and kept and cherished in the planetary genius and it will bring fruition at another time in another place from that same thought and it will have ripples too you know i mean the ripples from the lives of you know they were oh, yeah. ordinary human beings with their flaws but of of john kennedy and his brother and and dr king you know those ripples go on and on or our friend mr presley for example you know mm -hmm. uh, the ripples from from his life or you know the more than ripples they're like tidal waves and each one of us <laughs> you know there's a wonderful book called um he and i by uh gabrielle um Bussis. i hope i'm pronouncing her name right a french woman intimate conversations with jesus christ that she started having when she was a teenager and um and at one point he says to her if only you knew the ripples across 
time and across cause and effect of each moment of, of grace that you give, each kind word, each thought of God, each gesture in the middle of a day of, you know, of weariness and stress, each, you know, reaching out to some person who thinks, who feels like they're crass and vulgar, but they're a spark of God. He said, if you, if, he said only I can see it, the ripples in your life, but I will show you. The time will come and you will see the ripples of grace and the gifts that, that flowed out of those ripples across time. And that's what it feels like, you know, the planetary genius is about those, those unseen ripples and gifts of grace that we didn't even know we were giving, you know, that we, that we didn't even know we were setting into action are all cherished and preserved and harvested. Yeah. yeah. And, and especially, you know, my heart goes out to those people who are nameless, faceless. They'll never be famous. They'll never be recognized by anyone. They won't get a medal. They won't even get a pat on the back, some of them. You know, maybe they have a yeah. tragic situation in the family where they're not even being recognized for their goodness. And and they have flaws and they've done things that they they berate themselves for. And yet they have the shining qualities in them. And they've tried so hard to do the right thing. And they think at the end of their lives, I failed, I failed. Mm. And yet they have, there is no such thing. As long as the heart remains strong and tries its best, there is no such thing as failure. Failure is when you simply turn it all loose and say, I don't care. When you really don't care. And unfortunately, there are some souls that have reached that desolation. But even they have a chance to come back and care again, you know. Yeah, and um, you know, Tolkien in, in Lord of the Rings, they you know talk about this, and some of the scholars I've heard say that you know Tolkien was a Catholic, a devout Catholic, and in the story you confront despair, which is the ultimate failure, and he says it's not simply a sin; it's a mistake. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Failure only becomes failure when you call it failure. Otherwise, it's just another step along the journey. But despair is a mistake. I mean, you know, Gollum bites off Frodo's finger, seizes the ring, and is dancing at the edge of, you know, the crack of doom. And, you know, Aragorn's about to be killed. Gandalf's about to be killed. You know, Frodo's going to bleed to death sitting there. And, you know, and Gollum has the ring. And here come the Nazgul, and here comes Sauron, and it's all over. And you may despair now. This is it. It's all over. Now you can despair. <laughs> right? <laughs> then comes what Tolkien called, okay, there's catastrophe, which is a sudden terrible turn for the worst. And then there's what he said should be called eucatastrophe, right? With the prefix EU as in euphonious or, you know, which means a sudden dramatic turn for the best. And so, you know, Frodo struggles with Gollum and Gollum tips too far, falls into the crack of doom and all is safe. And you were at a moment of, of, of something like that. I think of you catastrophe and it's difficult, as you say, on the emotional level to simply write off our mother earth as we experience her, you know, and we don't, that is the thing as, you know, as passionate a commitment to this beautiful manifestation of Gaia that, you know, I'm sitting here on the slopes of these glorious mountains here in the San Luis Valley. And yeah, you know, as, as are you and Gaia's beauty and, and reality are you know, unignorable here. And so I've just got to work with what I've got. You know, this is, um, as you say, we bandage up the wounds. We, you know, we perform that good that is immediately in front of us to give. And if we're called to it, like the people who are, you know, working with you in the Quantum Logica Interactive, um, called to do this, this work that is helping on the big picture level also, well, great. And then you go out and do whatever you're called to do in your daily life, whether you're, you're a teacher or you're working, you know, with um, making sure that animals are treated well or you're, you know, removing pollution in, in your area of, of Gaia's garden. 
that's that's the whole dynamic all comes together. Um, you know, no effort is lost. And I think of, um, you know, the, the Templar motto, when it's like all these people, no fame, no recognition, no medal, not even a pat on the back. Well, non nobis domine, said nomine tuo da gloriam. It's not unto us, O oh Lord, but to thy name be the glory. Or as our friend um, Bart in Belgium, you know, who is a member of uh, the Order of the Unknown Servants. The joy, the privilege, the recognition is simply the service. And being known is not only not, you know, necessary, it's like, you know, I mean, it feels good. Let's say, you know, as human beings, we, we want, you know, and in some level it's a, it's a reflection of a divine reality of our, our recognition by Divine Mother herself. We yearn for that. And yet, we experience it when when we when we give it and surrender it because the the service itself is all the joy and recognition you need absolutely yeah well i feel like this might be a, a good time to um you know to let this episode close i do want to say again um if you are listening to this and feeling drawn to the work and, and wondering what's my part, what's my role, I want to know more. Uh, and again, this is just me giving a, a bare-faced plug for, um, because it helps support this work and, and Maya's work for, um, if you feel drawn to it, you know, meditate, check in with your own intuition. Uh, that Maya is a wonderful spiritual counselor with access to the Akasha. And so uh, take that in and, and consider. And there's a little, a brief little, brief little blurb at the end of the program with, with how to uh, make that happen for yourself. So any, any and last. Also, I'm, I'm going to put a plug in for quantum logic interactive. Not that we're I'm trying to get tons of people involved. It's just that I feel that there are people out there that would, feel very good about being a part of this so if you're one of them that think you might be you know just get in touch with me and um uh, the the only you don't have to buy anything but uh if you're uh you do need to be on facebook or at least just for that you know so you can get into the the chat and the group so just contact me on facebook and uh you know if you're looking to do that Right. And I will say also, you know, like um, a lot of other uh, groups and institutions, we deeply appreciate any support you can give. There's a um, donation link at the bottom of the, the YouTube video um, for the Sacred Academy of Geoenergetics, SAGE, uh, which sponsors Maya's work, uh, among other things. So with that, bless you and thank you for being with us on Blue Star Rising. God bless us, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Bye.